Okay, well, I'd like to welcome to the buy round the biggest cross code superstar, one of Australia's sport and greats, most recognizable person in Australian sport, arguably a TV and media darling personality, none other than Big Dell. So thanks for joining us here on the buy round, mate. Mate, good to be here, mate. I think you've been too kind, mate. We've had a lot of uh, cross star. Jules, and uh, I'm just one of many, but uh, very proud of my achievements. Uh, hasn't always been smooth sailing, but nonetheless, um, looking forward to talking to you and having honest chats. That's what I like to do. Yeah, well, mate, no, no one's career really is all smooth sailing. No, no it'd be boring if it was. It would be, wouldn't it? Would. And it, it's impo- I, I think it's important, just going slightly off track here, yeah. when we look at um, you know the, the high-profile fo- high players, it's important that they do set a good example, but it's important that that youngsters know that we make mistakes. Let's not hold, you know, these superstar players to an unrealistic expectation. And, sh- and as parents, you got to show, look, even those people do make mistakes, but guess what? There's an opportunity to come back. Because I think that puts unnecessary pressure on youngsters that, like this, you know, the ideal person to live like that all the time. It's just unrealistic. We're, we're human beings. We all make mistakes, right? Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, you know, I'm a father of three. Mm. I think you're a father of two. Um, and it's one of those things where I think I was always taught, like, if you make a mistake, own your mistake. And, um, yeah, so my mum my mom and dad taught me that. Obviously, my mum, I don't know, mate, she needed a medal bringing me up because I was always in the naughty corner at school. It's funny, I wasn't a bad kid at school, but... I just wanted to talk all the time and I wanted to talk over the teachers and I wanted to, to, to draw a crowd over to me. Yeah. So, you know, you know what it's like. We'd have been good. We'd have been great at yeah. school together. hundred percent. I was, I was a big distractor. Yeah, that's, my that's teachers, me. teachers like, ask a question. Yeah. Divert them from yes. the subject yeah. topic. Yeah. Before you know it, lesson's over. Yeah. But you again, didn't I say? Yeah. That's yeah. Good. I think you, 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 you remind me of that, like in school you get, you get good shits yeah. and you get bad shits. Yeah. Sometimes you cross over a little bit. I was I was a good shit at school. Yeah. Like, you know, a bit of banter with the teachers. Yeah. A shit, but a good shit. Well, look, mate, I, what happened to me is like now when, when they try and control me around Triple M, like sometimes I get too excited and obviously, you know, producer tra- Charlie tries to sort of drag me in and make sure I'm concentrating or uh, Laura Boucher. Um, like, if I'm focused, man, I am, you know, I'm on. But if I get too excited and there's something over here and I'm on the phone, so even like now in the studio, when I do Rush Hour, I um I have to put my phone outside. She doesn't let me have my phone inside. So, uh, and I think that's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. Del. Um, last week we had um your former teammate Gordon Tallis on. Love Big Gordy. We all love Big Gordy. Love Big Gordy. He's a straight shooter. He um accused you of um making a pact in Leeds about yep. staying at the Broncos, and then his mum calls him up and goes, oh. Wendell's gone to rugby union, and he's and he's like, no, no, we made a pact, mum, and he. Yeah, yeah well, that's, yeah. that's true. You know what? Look, I like to think that I'm a man of my word, and of integrity. But I suppose we'd won the World Cup, we'd beaten New Zealand, and then there was myself, Shane Webke, Darren Lockyer. We were you know, the only four Broncos sort of in that side, and like, it was a pretty fair year for us too, because we'd um, we'd beaten the Roosters that year in 2000, and then after we beat New Zealand in the World Cup, um, we're at. Uh, hotel and then we're all going out and then Gordy because Gordy's such a you know Gordy and I have been mates since we've been 13, 14 um, he's from Townsville I'm from Mackay Serene area and um, he sort of grabbed me and goes mate we got to stay together Del you know we, we can win a couple premierships together and of course I got pumped up too because you know I, I had a good World Cup and I go yeah mate you're right and, and I remember we actually called Wayne Bennett so whatever time it was and Wayne took the call and and um, Wayne actually said to me he goes mate you know we got a four-year deal for you here. We, we finally think that you've arrived as a world-class winger now. And this was like 2000, so you think about it. It took Wayne, he signed me in 93 on $5,000 contract. And then it was 2000, so seven years, no matter what I've done in and around Origin and that. And obviously I'd won two premierships before then. Wayne said, you've obviously, you've arrived as a World Cup winger, uh, world-class winger. Mate, we're going to give you a four-year deal. And it was a four-year deal, um, 400000 a year for four years. So 1.6 for a, for a winger. That was good money back then in 2000, you know. Um, so I said, yeah, mate, I said, I'm going to stay in the third party deals. I said, yeah, I'm going to stay. And I said, Gordy, and we, we all shook hands and with me, Lockie and Webby, and we just had a few more beers. And I'm going, yeah. And then, I don't know, by the time that, 
the alcohol wore off <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I got back and my manager said, mate, um, rugby union, mate, Eddie Jones wants to meet you. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, mate, what's the deal? And he said, mate, it's 800000 a year, four-year deal, whether you play for the Wallabies or not. And so I went back and spoke to Wayne, and Wayne goes, mate, well, we can't match that. But look, if you want to go, you go, but you'll always be a Bronco. And at that time, I don't think Wayne minded too much, even though I, I gave him my word, because I had two young guys called Lottie DeKiri and Justin Hodges coming mm. through, so I don't think it was too bad. But yeah, sorry, Gordy, Lockie and Webby, but I'm pretty sure you guys done all right without me. Yeah. Did, <clears throat> was any part of that for you to, to go up against Jonah Loma at all? Yeah, it was. A big part of it. You know... When you look at the wingers, the world-class wingers all around the world in both codes, um, you know, Lottie DeCury was coming through and he was a young bloke I brought through and I knew he was going to be the next big thing. Uh, but every time you watch Rugby Union, you're watching, you know, Jonah Lomo and these guys, you know, you're watching Joe Alivadiri, all these, the, the big Fijian guy, and I'm going, mate, I'd love to play South Africa, you know. They had some really good wingers too and some good outside backs. And I just thought, that's, that's a world stage, mm. you know. England, Ben Cohen. You know? Well, mate, that, that's, where, where Rugby League... I think lets itself down is we're, we're not an international brand. Like I grew up in, in Liverpool when people don't know much about league or union. But you know what? They all knew Jonah Loma. 100%. You know, when, they when all you, knew yeah. Joan, Jonah Loma. When you and and that's, the, that's the platform that union can give. That, that's what frightens me about guys like Matt Burton, uh, Young Suwalihi, that rugby union can yeah. give them a global platform. When you think about the 97 Super League, we got promised uh, by John Rebo that we're going to be known in China and all over the world and that. That didn't happen. Like, that was just, that was just, that was a sales pitch to, to get us in, but it doesn't matter. It changed the game, you know. I know some people don't recognise Super League, but for me, I think it changed the game as in the value of players and obviously the brand of what was happening with football because ARL and NRL, you know, they, they'd split, uh, Super League split, but then they came back together in 98. Um, but when you talk about Jonah, you know, back to that, you know, you talk about Pelé, you know, Maradona, mm. those Tiger, those, you know, those icons of sport, you know. Um, it's unbelievable, you know, like Fedra. You know, yeah. Jonah was there. Jonah yeah, wasn't yeah. just the king of the wing. Jonah, he changed the game. And I wanted to play against Jonah. And I remember I got to play against Jonah only once. Um, in 2002, I obviously signed... And uh, Ben Toon was, he was the best winger in the Wallabies. So um, as we're going to play Wellington Hurricanes, what I liked about Ben Toon is he looks at me and he goes, he goes, he goes, mate, I'm Mark and Jonah. I said, sweet, because I don't, didn't want to walk in there thinking like, I've earned that right. Because I was like a rookie in rugby having mm. to earn that right. Anyway, I'm standing, I'm standing at the Par Palmerston North ready to go out. And, you know, the Wellington Hurricanes are pretty fair. So I've got Christian Cullen, Tana Rumanga, all these classy players. And the next minute I'm sort of looking up. And I've always been a big, big winger, you know, in rugby league. And as I'm looking to my right, I sort of look over and I keep looking and there's this big Polynesian guy and I keep looking and it's Jonah. And I'm going, mate, this bloke's bigger than... It's the first time I've ever really seen Jonah. I've seen him at a promo once before that for Ray-Ban back in, oh, in the 90s. At some stage, we were both with Ray-Ban. But can I tell you, oh, someone that big who can move that well, uh, who, he changed the game, not just as in wing play, but as in an outside back. Uh, he was ferocious, but he was such a gentle giant off the field. Mm. And Jonah and I become good mates over the years. I only got to play him once. They beat us 16-12 that game. And, uh, mate, we couldn't handle him that game. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to the, yeah. to the, the rugby stuff a, a yeah, little bit sure. later. But um, <clears throat> you, the guy you spoke about bringing you through at the Broncos, Wayne Bennett, can you tell us about the impact that, that he had on you as a, as a youngster oh. and how he continues to impact your life now? In the present day, yeah, mate. He's, mate, you know what? I I sort of tear up sometimes about him because, like, for me, you know, when I went there in 1993, um, he didn't really want to sign me. Like, he, all fairness to him, I had a high opinion of myself. This will this will shock you. I had a high opinion of myself. <laughs> so all through the juniors, and I could make North Queensland, and and I'd make the Queensland like uh, Catholic side, Queensland Indigenous side, but I could never make the, sort of the full Queensland side. You know, Anthony Seabold was a guy that always made those Queensland sides. So Anthony Seabold. One of my best mates. So Anthony Seabold and I both went to the Broncos. Um, Seabold was signed. Uh, I rocked up for a week of training. And um, Wayne, Wayne just, he actually said to me, he goes, mate, to be honest, he goes, I've seen you play. He goes, I think, you know, because I was a centre back then. I was a centre fullback. He goes, I think you're a bit lazy. And, and you're, a bit, you're, you're a bit too full of yourself. And I don't think you'll make it uh, in, in my, uh, at the Broncos. And at this stage, I don't forget, he's just sacked Wally Lewis like 18 months before or whatever. So if he's not copping Wally Lewis, I'm not saying I'm Wally Lewis, but <coughs> he's not copping egos because he's about, you know, team camaraderie and that. Anyway, so um, I had this week of training there and I was lucky because Cyril Connell was the guy who backed me. Everyone thinks that Wayne was the guy who signed me. He did sign me, but on the back of Calvin Giles, 
Calvin Giles, I don't know if you remember this, Calvin Giles actually signed, um, oh, actually trained uh, the, uh, the Great Britain side, mm. and he trained Daly Thompson and Linford Christie. And actually, he actually said to Wayne, he goes, and halfway through the week of training, I actually, because I was more a runner than a footballer, and he said, um, he said, mate, this Wendell Saylor, he goes, mate, I don't know if he can bloody play football, but shit, he can run. So Wayne, so Wayne sort of took notice of that because it was Calvin Giles, mate. You know, mm. Calvin Giles changed the game as in power, strength, and the fitness and the way that w- the way the game was played. Canberra set a standard, and then so did they. Um, so the Broncos. Anyway, so at the end of the week, there was this last day, and I knew that I had to do something really special to get Wayne to sign me because I didn't want to go back home to Serena. All my mates go, oh, mate, I thought you were signing with the Broncos because yeah. four clubs had knocked <clears> me back. Um, the Dragons, Illawarra. Um, the Bulldogs, and I knew I was going real shit when the Gold Coast Seagulls sort of, you know, they didn't sign me. So <laughs> I knew I was going real shit. So I was all in here. Anyway, so um, we had this 400 metre race, and then I was in the second group, like the reserves and 21s, and there's a first grade group. There was Chris John, Steve Ranoff, um, there was Kevy Walters, there was all these Willie Kahn, Mick Hancock, and then Calvin Giles looks at me and he goes, Oi, you. Young kid from country, sailor, sailor, get here. He called me like, he's a sailor. And he liked me because that athlete background. And he goes, oi, get up here. He goes, get in here. So I was in the middle. And so I'm pushing in, I'm in the middle. And I couldn't get in because all the big dogs are pushing in. So I just sort of sat in behind him. And he goes, I want you to fucking win this race. I said, what? He goes, you win this race. So the 400 meter race at Cadre, remember it. So as goes, go. And I knew there's like, there's a crowd, like, you know, the football crowd. Mm. And that's what we, that's what we live for. Anyway, everyone shoots off. So I'm sitting there, I'm sitting. I started to make my move. And about 200 metres, there's about two blokes in front of me. Mick Hancock and I think it was Chris Johns. They were the best 400 metre runners at the club. Anyway, so it's about 150 to go. And I just, I, just, I just push out and I go fucking bang. And I win it. Calvin Giles looks at me and he goes, that's my boy. That's my boy. <laughs> and, then, and after that, Wayne gets me in his office. And for me, I'm going, that's that moment. That's that moment that when you're a young kid... You need that moment. These guys won the premiership in '92. They'd beaten, um, they'd won, they'd beaten Wigan in the World Club Challenge. I'm racing the best of the best, yeah. mate. So there's my self belief and thinking I belong here, but I've got to earn the right to be here. So all these boys go, this kid can run, but can he play? So, so at the end of that week, Wayne gets me in his office and he goes, "What are you thinking about doing next year?" And I said, "Look, I don't know." I said. You know, I was going to get a trade or I wanted to be a police officer. I would have been the most corrupt police officer in the world, I reckon. <laughs> uh, I'm serious. I wanted to study justice. I would have been, uh, you know, remember they said that show on Underbelly? It would have been Under Delhi. Yeah. So, um, so Wayne sits me in here. So we're, <laughs> we're <laughs> I'm serious. Might have been the worst cop. Well, we're sitting here like this and Wayne looks at me and he goes, okay, I told you what I think of you. He goes, I wasn't, wasn't a fan of yours. He goes, you've trained well this week. And he goes, mate, I'm going to give you five. He goes, can you play? So at this stage, Wayne Bennett goes, can you play? So he's seen me play, but he wants to see from me my body language. And I said, yeah, I can play. And then, cause, Because I feared like, like not saying the wrong thing, so he'll just go, me, mm. wipe me. But I'm going, you know, well, this is my chance. I've got to tell him I can play. So I'm sitting there, and he puts it back on you. I looked at him, and I go, yeah, I can play. And he goes, you've got a $5,000 contract. We'll pay your board. Um, so you get up with the family, but I want you to go and study for six months and then get a job and then we'll see how you go. If you go all right, we'll re-sign you. If not, you're back to Serena Champ. I was going, okay. So that's what you need. I feared failure, but he gave me the opportunity to be to be the best of the best and you're training with the best. And then so I ended up living with Anthony Seabold. We lived with a family and the family we lived with, um, they were great. Seabes was going to uni. He was studying at um, the Catholic University. And uh, Willie Kahn was going out with uh, one of the daughters there. And let me tell you, not that we perv, but the daughter was unbelievable. That's all <laughs> I'll say. Uh, her name was Michaela. Uh, she was a couple years older than us. She was at uni. And um, me and Seabes were like two 18-year-olds. And we were like kid in the candy store going, like, how good is this? We're at the Broncos. We're playing under 21s. There was us two, a guy called Chris McKenna yeah. and Sid Domic. And then Sid Domic, so we, we were the 21 Broncos and we were playing out of the Sunshine Coast, the Kiwana Broncos. So that was my first year at the Broncos. Yeah. And obviously, so Wayne was pretty impactful, but you, you, am I right in thinking you still speak to him on a sort of weekly basis oh. even now? Well, I'll be honest. Like the last couple of years, it's been the toughest couple of years, I think. Of my life, my dad died in two thousand one. He was he was there for me. He was, mate, he's, he's a great man. I, lo- I love the bloke. He's people just say how good of a coach he is, and I think you know this. You, you love him. I, I love him. And um, when my dad passed away in two thousand one, he's been a real good 
mentor for me, always a good father figure. And the last couple of months, you know, I haven't been at my best and he knows that. So he'd call me and he just goes, oh, mate, he goes, um, how you been? And I said, mate, all right. And he goes, mate, you've been doing a good job at Triple M, but you've been a bit off lately. And I said, oh, I've just got plenty going on. So he gave me the tools to sort of reset myself. And in the last couple of months, I sort of got back on track, but he just checks in with me and he knows how to sort of, it's like when you just need someone just to sort of, um, just to let you know that you, that what you need to do to get back on track, but they care about you. He cares. He cares. That's it. That's he, it. Yeah. he cares about you know his that. players. And he, I know the way he, he spoke to you um, about, because uh, Magic Round, I had a good Magic Round, probably too good of a Magic Round, and, and, and I reset there, but we, you, myself, and that, we were speaking, and then he spoke, and he was on fire. He, he, gets, he gets everyone eating out of the palm of his hands, doesn't he? Mm. People don't know the real Wayne Bennett, you know? Um, you know, I, I love the guy, um, and to be honest, without him, I wouldn't have fulfilled my career in football, but even as, as a person, uh, as a husband or as a father or as a mate. So, um, and we have honest conversations. And what I like about Wayne is he doesn't think he's that perfect. Everyone mm. thinks Wayne's like God and he's like, but he'll tell you his deficiencies or his shortcomings too. And that's what I like about him. That's what mm. I like about with my mates. If you can say that you're, you're, you're not perfect, yeah. it, it, helps, it yeah. helps you. Yeah, he's... He's great for that, and yeah. he he does his his biggest strength. I think is that he cares, and he doesn't not just cares about the result, but he cares about the individual yeah. and the person, and not just making them better footballers, but making them quality human beings. And <clears throat> he acknowledges that people do make mistakes, but then he's bit on the team environment, yeah. have each other's back, yeah. so he doesn't enjoy people messing up no. or laughing at that. He spoke about that at a time at the Dragons there, where he said. You know, someone had got into trouble and he blew up at the senior players for not getting them out of there, for standing there and laughing. Yeah. And that, and that and that's what he brings. He creates that mateship. He's big on mateship. Yeah. And and having each other's back. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't want you to have a good time because I'll tell you the story. So I, I remember a lot of things about Wayne, but also about having good times because I've got the best memory about having good times because I like having a good time. But no. You, no, I do. <laughs> but you just can't have too much of a good time. So 2000, we'd beaten the Roosters. There's a place called City Rolls. I don't know if you've ever been there. Everyone loves City Rolls. It was the place to go. Anyway, so it was day two. And let's just say a few of us hadn't had too much sleep, okay? And there was Gordon Tallis, there was Darren Lockyer, Kevin Walters, you know, City Rolls. Uh, it was the middle of the day uh, on a Monday. And um, this will shock you. I had my shirt off, okay? I had my shirt <laughs> off and then I'm loving life. And then I'm looking at Wayne and I said, Wayne, you must get an ego from all these guys you've coached, you've taken from young men to like, you know, premiers and, you know, um, you know, playing for Australia and Queensland. <sighs> he looks at me and he goes, what my job is, Del, as a, as a mentor and a, as, a, as a father figure and also as a coach is what sort of men you will become when you finish playing football. And at that stage, I was going, yeah, Benny, yeah. And I was like, you know, dancing. But then... What it did with me, I never forgot that. It resonated with me because when I finished footy and I went to rugby and all that, and even when I went through tough times, mate, he was still there because he cares about you, as we said. And um, I think that's pretty, you know, you think about it now, the bloke's 73, 74, he's still coaching. He's still got so much to offer. See, I still win the grand final last year on the back yeah. of on his coaching, you know. Dimitri's mm -hmm. done a good job this year, but he's no Wayne Bennett. I feel sorry for Dimitri because... Coaching after Wayne Bennett's like going on stage after Frank Sinatra, you know? Good luck, mate. <laughs> well, mate, you look back at, at last year, <clears throat> he did it without Latrell Mitchell as well. Yeah, he did. Like, I know. And he was out and most people put the line through them. Yeah. But then they forgot about the guy in the coach's box. Yeah. And that, that's probably not too dissimilar to, to Melbourne next year. Yes, they're losing some vast experience, yeah. but there's a guy in the coach's box that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, uh, but yeah, look, you got, you got young Blake Tough. I knew Blake Tough could play a little bit, but... Taft played out of his skin in the grand final. He mm. probably didn't. He made a couple of mistakes. But, mate, they were probably one pass away from winning it. Like, mm. when Cody Walker throws that pass, Crichton on that right-hand side, he hides a bit knowing that Cody might go short along, but he mm. knows that Cody wants to go long because Cody wants to go to the big play. And, and he pops out Crichton at the right time, gets his mitt there, takes that, you know. That's uh, credit to Crichton, too, because he knows, he knows the big play. He knows yeah. he's got to make that play all in. Wayne was obviously... A, a huge in influence on you and, and your time at the Broncos, but is there anything specifically that, that set you guys apart and, and what you can put it down to why you were so successful in that era there? Yeah, just the camaraderie and the accountability. Like, Alan Langer, can I just tell you this? Alan Langer should get as much credit for that Broncos culture as Wayne Bennett. I know Wayne's obviously, he, he should get, Wayne should get most of the, the accolades. There's a guy called Cyril Connell as well, and then Calvin Giles was there. You know, great 
English man like yourself. Um, actually, my three favourite English blokes up there are probably you, Sam Burgess, and um, and Calvin Giles. Calvin Giles is an absolute legend. You'd love Calvin Giles. Um, real passionate like you and Sam are. Um, I, I think for me, Broncos, it was accountability. Mate, we didn't mind going out, having a good time, doing what you had to do. But what it was is you had to aim up. And if you were late, you got fined. And then you did feel bad. You didn't think, mm. man, I got fined three or four times there. This will shock you. Um, I, I was late a couple of times and I got fined for, for being late just from sleeping in and I, was, I wasn't I was big on setting my alarm clock. Being a country boy and being a big uh, island boy and um, my, my dad was very relaxed sort of thing. And I was very relaxed but no one ever really pulled me in the line about because I'd always sort of been, when I was in the juniors, I'd always been the sort of the star, like cricket or a star football player or athlete. So I, no one actually really pulled me in the line. Mm. So it's like the naughty little boy that gets away with a lot until you pull him in the line. And then... I know one time, um, after four or five times, uh, Glenn Lazarus goes, I was half an hour late for a meeting. It was a meeting. I knew training started, but it was half an hour. But you have to beat the meetings. Yeah. And I just thought, well, <clears throat> I'm not really in the starting team. I'm in the, reserve. I'm, I'm in the reserves, but I'm, I'm on the fringe. And I walked in, and uh, Lazo goes, Oi, come here. I went, what? And he goes, where you been? I said, mate, I've been sleeping. He goes, mate, what makes you think that you're any better than us? We can all get here on time. Why can't you? This is Glenn Lazarus. Let me tell you, you know, Lazo was, he was one of the best. And it was funny because blokes either loved Lazo or they hated Lazo. Um, oh, I love Lazo. He was great to me. And then that made me realise I got fined four or five times and I think I got fined about four grand. But the money wasn't, I didn't care about the money at the time. Not that I wasn't earning big money, but... Until he pulled me in the line, and then there was Alan Cairn, there was Trevor Gilmeister, you know, there was blokes like Kevy Wilder, Steve Renoff. I mean, he's right, mate. What makes me think that I was any better than these yeah. guys? These are premiership players. These are guys playing for Australia and Queensland. Um, and this was sort of 94, 95. So I'd, I'd played for Australia at 20. So I played one test for Australia at Wembley. We got beaten. Um, but I'm thinking, mate, I've made it. I'm playing for Australia. I'm playing the Broncos. And then I had to reset myself and understand... You've got to earn the respect of your of your peers, and that's what I think made me such a good club man at the Broncos, and that's what made our culture because you pull blokes into line. Yeah, yeah, that account uh, accountability yeah. is is massive, and not not having that <clears throat> your time is more important than anyone else's. Yeah, like that's yeah. Wayne was big on that. Being, yes, like being like he didn't did not enjoy it. No, um, one bit. What what about mate in terms of people's perception of you? Like some people look at you as a bit of a, a bad boy. Does that um, yeah, no, this, does that affect you at all? Does it, does it impact you? No, look, I think I think with my with my rap sheet, you know, it's obviously uh, you know I've been in trouble for road rage, and obviously you know I got to spend at the World Towers for partying. Um, I got in trouble when I was at the Wallabies for fighting in South Africa when I should have been at home. Uh, um, you know, I got stood down a couple of times, and it's funny, like you know, you thought you think I would have learnt my lesson from one of the Broncos, but I suppose once I got to the Wallabies, I don't know, I just set myself some new rules that, mate, this is how good am I going? Rather than, rather than <laughs> think, you, you know what, yeah, rather than think, okay, you know what, I've been in trouble a couple <clears> of times, <throat> I need to reset my behaviour and just start again. And I had really good people around me, but then also I had people who, who probably didn't have my best interests at heart, mm. and they're the people that I want to hang out with because. They let me get away with what I want to get away with. The people that pulled me in the line, I sort of pushed them away a bit. Mm. So really it came back down to what I wanted. And what I wanted was a few shortcuts off the field. So I wanted to play footy and, and have a good time off the field. I wanted to go to the A-list nightclubs. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to party. And, 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 and that invariably got me in trouble and cost me a couple of years. But, but I think the hardest thing for me was I'm not a bad boy. I like to think that people think I'm a scallywag. Mm. And scallywag's a word that I use because it's, I think it's something that came through the 90s and that we had a lot of scallywags. And you look at, um, at Triple M, Mark Guy. Mark Guy's been a great mentor for me. I love MG. He's, he's been great. Matty Johns, these guys, Andrew Johns, these guys. These guys, when I went to Triple M, these guys were the guys that I, I looked up to. But also, Matty Johns used to text me, and it's like with Aaron Woods now. I text, I love Woodsy, I love working with you. I text uh, Aaron Woods and go, mate, you're killing it, because... Matty Johns used to do it to me. I love that when we can be ourselves because no one can do what we've done in football. No one's taken the hits. No one's been knocked out in the football field and fractured his eye socket like, like I have and then gone, had, my, had my wife and kids in there and my daughter's crying saying, you okay, Dad? And my, mm. my eyes closed up. The next morning, I, then I reset and go, you know what, I'm going to go again. And then the next morning, they go in through my eye, push it out like a tire lever. And so in that eye, you know, Titanium played six screws. Mate, but I know our fans can have their opinions, but no one goes into battle like we do. We love the mm. fans. So when I sit there now, I think I got to 48, 
And I'm quite content with myself. I'm quite thinking, like, I don't care what people think of me. But yeah. w- what I do care about is the people that I work with, the people that um, that make me better. But also, I just want to be myself. For the first time in a long time, I think I can be myself. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good on you, mate. Thanks, you too. Yeah. yeah. Um, quite emotional then, actually, yeah. <coughs> uh, the, the stint at the Wallabies, um, we, we spoke about how that gets you on that global stage. Yeah. How did you handle that? I believe you met um, Nelson Mandela on your, oh. on your travels as well. Well, that's that's probably the most famous person I met. Obviously, I got to meet the Queen, and God, God bless her. I got to meet her twice, 94, um, when I was in the kangaroo side. Um, mate, that was unbelievable. I'm seeing her with Mel Meninga, and then the Queen's there, and it was unbelievable. And then I got to meet her again in 2000 and, 2000 and I think, oh, 2005, I think, I got to meet her again uh, with guys, I think, like, there was Drew Mitchell and uh, Matt Giddo and those guys. But it was good to see the Queen again. I don't think she remembered me, but that's cool. Um <laughs> Um, but that was great. But Nelson Mandela was the one that I loved the most. Um, <laughs> Nelson Mandela, can I just tell you, when we played South Africa, we got told we are going to meet Mandela. And, and to meet him, it was his birthday at Alice Park. And to shake someone's hand like him, you think about what he's been through when he went to jail and to come out and not have that hatred. That's the guy that I looked up to. You know, I grew up with, you know, Kathy Freeman and I grew up with some really good people on that. But for me, you talk about sport and, you know, politics and that. What he did was amazing, and um, yeah, when I when I shook his hand, it was one of those things where it was so surreal. But at the start of that game, South Africa came out and went bang, bang, bang. We were down fourteen three after about twelve minutes. Just the passion that they played for for someone like him, you can understand how he brought a country together. Yeah, yeah. Did you do you look back and you're thankful you went to rugby union, yeah. or would you? I do. If I you mean, had I, your time again, do you think you'd you you think yeah. you'd change and no, maybe I, stay in league? You know what? I don't regret anything that I've done in, in my life uh, because I think it's made me better and made me learn from from my mistakes. But also, it just showed me, like, there's a lot of people walking out the door, a lot of people walking in the door. So, for me, I, I love what Rugby Union has given me um, and, and Rugby League as well. So, I played 16 years, you know, professionally, 11 years in league and five years in rugby, and even the two-year suspension, I'll cop that because if you don't play by the rules, you deserve to get suspended. I didn't play by the rules, I'll cop that. I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me because, you know what, I was playing for the Wallabies at the time. I was playing for the Waratahs. Um, I knew the rules. You have to own the rules. You can't. I didn't blame mental health. I didn't blame anyone else. But I just, I stuffed up and I had enough warnings to know if you keep playing with fire, you're going to get burnt. And, mate, I think rugby did the right thing by me. And I think the two years out made me better when I came back. Not as a, as a player because I was a bit more voluptuous, I would say. But to come back to rugby league, to see rugby league, Arthur Beats and Gene Miles... They threw me a lifeline. I was working in the communities. I was working, and I realised the impact that we have as players and ex-players. And then I realised, like, okay, the bright lights are really good, mm. but you know, working at that grassroots level when kids are saying, "Hey, big deal, how you going? When are you coming back? When are you going to play again? We miss you playing." And for me, I'm going like, you don't understand the impact you have on people because sometimes you live in your own little world. Me more so than anyone else. But uh, but that was that was what got me back to playing rugby league. And Nathan Brown was a catalyst for that. Yeah, it wasn't uh, big money. Yeah. yeah. On on the the sort of the, the yeah. party and stuff. What was behind that? With like, like why why did you turn to party? Like, was it just the environment that you and you felt you just couldn't say no? Your personality type. Uh, you were just attracted to that. Yeah, I think. Look, I think like at school, I I'm that person. Like, I just want to have a good time. I just, oh, mate, if there was a party on, like at school, we're going to that party. If uh, if we're going to a nightclub after a game, I, I'd always pack my going out clothes. You know, get ask Gordy <laughs> Tallisus and Darren Lockyer. Uh, you know, I'd be first. I'd be first. I'd be first to have a shower. And boys, where are we going to? Okay, let's go to Carmen's. Let's go to King's Cross. You know, and then, it, but it was. But then I think once I got to rugby. I think it changed like it was, you know, we were drinking and that, but then it was like, you go to these A-list nightclubs and then, you know, you're getting actors and singers who know you are. You know, I think there was, there was one time uh, around Super League there, World Nines, you know, and this, this is probably, for someone like me, and this is true, this is probably where I started to go, you know what? Where, where's something? I've done, I'm doing something with my life. There was, um, um, Mel Meninga said, hey guys, guys, so around the nine song, we, so we played nines with Australia, so there was Bradley Clyde, Brett Mullins, Steve Renoff, Mick Hancock, Alan Langer, all these guys, Laurie Daly, so man, and I'm, I'm, don't forget, I'm like, oh, I'm 22, 23, so I'm with these guys, and then Mel, Mel's, our, Mel's our coach, and Mel goes, hey boys, 
we're going to watch Russell Crowe's band play tonight at Balmain Hotel or whatever it is uh, around there, um, but you can't take any cameras uh, or anything. Well, like, no, back's a bit different back then. We said, why not? He goes, because Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise are going to be there and, you know, we're going to have a drink in that with them. I'm starting to think, oh, you know, and don't forget, you know, Cocktail and all these movies were out around then, so I'm thinking Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise, how good is this? And I was the pup of the sort of team too. So uh, as we get there... Um, you know, and what, my Russell Crowe, you know, he's you know, he's, he's just starting out. It's really cool. And you're sitting there and all of a sudden Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise sort of come up there and I'm just going, how good is this? And obviously I'm looking, I like Tom, but I'm looking at Nicole thinking, mate, look, what a good sort, you know? <laughs> anyway, so Steve Renoff, and we, we spoke about this out of, out of function just recently, actually on radio. Um, Steve Renoff was a little bit, because I wasn't a big drinker back then. So all of a sudden, um, Steve Renoff was a little bit like sort of tipsy and he's saying, oh, Nicole, I said, oh, mate, come on, mate, just give the ladies some space. Anyway, so you know exactly what I was doing, don't you? <laughs> so, so anyway, as I sat down, Nicole Kidman comes over and sits next to me. She goes, oh, thanks very much for that, you know, and how are you going and what's your name? And so then I'm thinking, you know, it, it pays to be nice and Tom's sitting there and then at the end of all this, we're all sitting there having a drink and then we start singing, uh, you've lost that love and feeling, you know? And it was, mate, it was like, so that sort of, I'm going, how good's this lifestyle? Mm. And don't forget, I'm 23, 24 at that time. That's the start of where I'm going from yeah. there, you know. You, then you win grand finals and you're playing for Australia and then, I don't know, you just get caught up in it. And, and yeah. from, from a kid who was from the country um, that was adopted at two days old, I'm just thinking how, how, how much my life's changed. So, you know, you get addicted to the bright lights and I think Drew Mitchell's got, got a great nickname for me, one of the best nicknames we've ever had. And he, I've got a lot of nicknames I've called myself, the Big Dell, the Jewel, you know, the Money Man, whatever. Drew Mitchell calls me the Moth. Because I'm addicted to the light. Because I'm because of the light. Because you know I'm always attracted to the light. He goes, "What are you doing, Moth?" I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Wherever the bright lights are, that's where you go." And that was a bit like my career and what I did. Yeah, yeah, F fair play. Um, af after the suspension, mate, you, you, I've heard you speak about just how grateful you were on that community level, but also for our game for 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 bringing you back as well. Yeah, look, I, I think for me, right because really, so it, yeah. when, when you get when you get banned like that. Mm. It's not necessarily rugby that bans you. It's the World Anti-Doping yes. Association, isn't it? So their hands are tied. They're, they're like there's no, the, it's, it's a mandatory two-year suspension well, from all competing sports other than ones that aren't sanctioned by WADA, correct? Well, well no, no. It, it's not a mandatory two years at the start, but then you can trade off and you could... So they said, they said to me, if you give us some names or whatever or wherever you're partying on who you're partying with, we can cut it back to a year. And I, there's a rule. Like, just... If you've made the mistake, you have to be accountable. You know, as my mum and dad said, you make the mistake, it's no one else's fault. So I, I thought to myself and my uh, management at the time, I said, look, this, mate, there was no one else that was... The guys I was with, it was on a Wednesday night, I was partying, um, and it was... I got tested, tested positive on the Sunday, and that was... Everyone's going, oh, mate, were you partying on the weekend? No, I wasn't. But, you know, people... So you were partying on the Wednesday and you Yeah, I, partying, I, I partied on a Wednesday night. I just, like, uh, Sunday... So when I started counting days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you probably think, OK, I probably, at the time, you're probably... You're pushing, you're pushing the boundaries, OK? We're all risk-takers, but, you know, I was taking the piss, like... Um, and, and it was one of those things where even when... I've got to tell you, even when I, I got uh, randomly selected, tested uh, after the Brumbies game, at no stage did I think that I'd test positive because it was Wednesday night... Mm. Sunday, everyone's going, two, three days out of your system. That's not the case. But anyway, so obviously players obviously know that because I, I spoke about it publicly. And so when I'm doing my urine test, not for a minute did I think, mate, he, he's gone two years of my career. And don't forget, I was, I was still had another year to go with the Waratahs and there was a World Cup in 2007. Mm. So, mate, there was a critical time for me. I think I was 29 or 30 at the time. So not saying that I was a spring chicken, but still I had, like, I, I was contemplating going to France after the World Cup 2007. But... I think the best thing for me is that I think it saved me in the way that I got away with so much from my career, not so much partying, but like everyone looked after me. And then what happens if everyone looks after you? You look after normal little boy. At some stage, you're just gonna you're gonna go down a down a rabbit hole that's mm. gonna be no good for you. So as I said, rugby league was great for me. Nathan Brown, the Dragons were great, but more so Artie Beetson and Gene Miles. They were the guys from the first couple of months who said, "Mate, we know you're a good person, but obviously you got to be excited. But we want you to come back and work in our program." So. I was doing stuff in grassroots and that, and to be honest, it wasn't just that. Even the, even Dancing with the Stars and all that, Channel 7 and all that, I, I do Dancing with the Stars and all that. I didn't have to do it, but I loved it. And I thought all that, all that time I spent in nightclubs and that was worth, um, was worth coming back from. So all those building blocks helped me to get back and helped me to be who I am. And to be honest, I don't regret any of it, even testing positive, because I didn't, you know, I think my te me testing positive... 
I think there was guys who were taking steroids and stuff that got banned for 22 weeks. And, and, and I wasn't going... Really? Like, yeah, there was, oh, you know, there was. I think there was guys in and around Super League who, you know, um, you know, um, I think Rodney Howe, and then you know there was a couple other guys, and I think Gordon Tallis. Can I tell you this story about Gordon Tallis? I know we're on a podcast. <clears throat> when we played, <laughs> when we played, um, when we played um, the Melbourne Storm in New South Wales, mate, Gordon Tallis was calling out Rodney Howe, going, mate, needles, tackle needles, you know. So, mm. mate, you know, he was pumped up. So, yeah, that was pretty fun. Well, well mate, e- even, <laughs> e- even on that suspension, if that was to happen today, I think it's something like a four week. It's four years now. Cause no, Bons- no, 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 because no. they ch- they've changed it. Remember, Brent Naden. Oh, yeah, no, no. So, yeah. so mine, I know, you know, I know that. So, no, I agree yeah. like that. Yeah, because, yeah, he, look, I, I, I agree. But you know what? I don't, I don't get dirty about that because, mm. mate, you know what? I knew the rules yeah. back then. Yeah. But, like, you know what? And, and for mm. me, yeah, I, I don't hold, and I said this to someone else. I don't wish that upon anybody because the thing around that it's not it's not just about you it's your family so yeah. like my kids got brought into it but also my mum I love my mum mm. so much so um, back back in Serena there was cameras in the media and they all thought I went back hiding out there but I was I was a Bronte at home but to put my mum through that and I've yeah. got to tell you the phone call it's like it's going to be a hard one because my mum passed away two years ago and I've got to tell you this story so when I got stood down. And I knew two or three days it was going to break. And I think the guy who broke the story at the time was Buzz Rothfield. That'll shock you. But so Buzz broke this story on the Sunday paper. I had to call my mum that Sunday morning to say, hey, mum, listen, you're going to hear some bad news. I've been stood down, um, you know, for, for, for partying. Um, and she said, what do you mean? What did you take? And she says, it's marijuana. I said, it's not marijuana. And when I said it was cocaine, you know, illicit drug, like I could hear the silence in her voice. Mm. And mate, look, no kid wants to put their parents through that. And my dad had died um, about four or five years before that. So my mum was never the same anyway. So when my, when, when my dad passed away, I reckon part of her died as well. So that was, that was a tough one for me too, because I never wanted to hurt my mum. And we were so close. Mm. And um, yeah, that was, that was the hardest thing. So she was the reason why I wanted to come back, other than my wife and kids as well, because they went through so much. Because when that happens, it's not just about you, you know? But no, that's, that's the demons that you have inside you. That, that's always been the hard thing for me mate like yeah. any incidents that, that, that I've been involved in I can handle it yeah like I'm in control I know things can get better but it's the the ripple effect that of course to, to your family that aren't prepared for it, you know and like even I think about like my mom or my nan it's like they're so proud of you of they course. Tell, you know they go down the little yeah. local shops and it's like oh I, you know the, 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 a lot of the conversation circles yeah. around you and your, your football but then when things go bad, they've got, they yeah. they cop it harder than you because you're course. just like, oh, I, I know some people are in for the ride and yeah. you know they'll they'll circle in and out and whatever, yeah. but it's the, the family that that it get is. hurt the most and are more affected by it. And, and you know what? Even that you know you you asked me the question before about you know um, it doesn't define you, but it just thinks it makes you stronger. And now I'm about to talk about topics that happened to me when I was younger, and they're not excuses. But I look at Latrell and all these guys that go through the current game, and I love watching Latrell. I love that he's a showman. But I just think I wouldn't survive in this day and age with um, with mobile phone, with um, with also with um, um, uh, the journalists and all that. Because back in the day, when journalists and I go at each other, I, I'd actually call them and give them a rev up. I won't say I won't say the journalist's name. There's a couple of journalists that I'd just go, mate. Mate, blah blah blah. Like, not th- not that you can't write bad articles, but I look at what Latrell's doing now. I love what Latrell's doing. You know, he's got a meeting out of the palm of his hand. Yeah. But I know for a fact that I protect my mum and dad from a f- few things mm. when I was younger. So when I was thirteen, you know, I understand the racism stuff with uh, Latrell on that when he talks about the Adam Good stuff. And sometimes I agree with it, and sometimes I don't. But I know when I was thirteen, when I was in North Queensland, I got walked out of a party because I was black. You know, and I know times have changed in that a little bit. Um, I remember being at this party and I was 13. This is what people don't understand. You get to talk about some certain things in and around racism and drugs and sport or whatever. I think the hardest thing I had to manage was when I was growing up and you go through that racism stuff and when you get bigger and stronger and I think it it, it makes you stronger because you're just not going to let them win. And I remember I was at this does party. Does that stay with you though? Oh, it does. Mate, yeah, it, it does. It does. You're not, never going to let that go. Like, no, I know because mate, you want to let it go, but you know what? You can't. I, I tell you how. I tell you exactly how it happens, and I tell you now. You can remember it yesterday, like yesterday. And that's why Adam Goods and that. I don't. My mates go. Oh, Adam Goods. It was a 13, 14 year old girl. What they don't understand. It's not about that moment. It's 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 what's happened to you in and around that. Mm. So I remember I was thirteen. Hasn't we had a good day at football? Was at this party, 
and I was the only sort of uh, you know dark kid there, which is which, you know, which is fine because that's the way we grew up. So, you know, there was a lot of um, you know there was um, you know Polynesian kids, there was Indigenous kids, there was you know there was a lot of different kids, you know Indian kids up there in uh, North Queensland. Anyway, so I was at this party having a good time, and the girl's dad walks in and she goes, "What's the darky doing here?" Like, and and like I heard it, but I'm trying to ignore it because I've heard that stuff before. So then her brother comes over and says, "Hey." I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave the party. So then I have to call my mum and make up an excuse why I have to leave yeah. this party. So I said to my mum, my mum goes, I said, oh, mum, can you pick me up? I said, I'm not feeling well. I think I hurt myself at football. I'm just not well on the stomach. So I'd never, ever told my mum and dad that story. Yeah. you know. And not that, But I think that steals me for whatever happens in life, but it's happened to my kids, and that's what makes me so passionate. When the racism comes out and stuff, people go, oh, mate, look, people have got to let it go on that, mate. But it's it's hard when you've been, you know, you see Eddie Betts, you've seen, you know, um, Gordon Tallis spoke about it, Mel Meninga. I sat next to Mel Meninga and we spoke about it, G.I., Jonathan Thurston. And you know what, our game's changing so much soon now. We've got a lot of Polynesian players in our game. I think um, I think it's 55%, and I think it's 12.5% Indigenous players. But... That stuck with me, but don't worry. I use that as motivation to say, I'm not going to let you win, you know? But I think sometimes it gets me angry and it gets me to a point where I see red. Anyway, that's, yeah, that's... But that's just, that's just who I am and that's where I'm at at the moment with my life. Yeah, yeah. man, like, well, I, you wouldn't let that go? Yeah, you, I know, but you've you got to find a way to... To talk about it and mm. to make sure, and don't forget, my, my wife is obviously she's Australian. Obviously, my kids, are, you know, sort of half and and it sort of goes a bit of both ways sometimes too. Like, you know, I had family members who just, you know, who would just say, you know, why don't you marry one of ours? I was just going, well, you can't say that because, mm. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mate, on to on to today's well with the the current um, Broncos. Yeah. Just want to get your your thoughts on. And where you think they're at at the moment, and what what's what's going wrong up there? Look, I, look, I think Adam Reynolds did a really good job this year. I think he was a really good presence um, in and around that club. But I just think we lost our way, or the Broncos lost their way. I'm not going to kick the guys e either because, man, I mm. know the back end of that season. I think they won. They lost, you know, six out of the last seven games, and it's the pressure of it. Um, you know, you got blokes like Tony Staggs up there who I think is a wonderful player. But I think I think for us in general. But you lost confidence. You can't afford to yeah. lose confidence. You, you know what that's like. You've been at, you was at the, at the Dogs. I was at the Queensland Reds, and I think only one year I think we finished fifth. And then I think at the Queensland Reds, I think for th the next three years we were bottom two, bottom three, and it's not mm. a good feeling when you're playing. You're playing not to get the wooden spoon. But like they were in the mix. They were fourth there in the last I don't know, eight weeks yeah. or something. They lost confidence. Um, they started. You know what? I reckon because a lot of young players there too. You start listening to the outside noise, how good you were, and that's what happens sometimes. Mate, I admit, mate, if I would have had social media, I'm thinking, you know what, mate, mm. we're a big chance of winning it this year. And, mate, they had all the ingredients, but comes the end of the season, and we've seen it. Like, I, I couldn't back them in the season. I was going, like, against the Dragons, I was yeah. just going, mate, I think we, I think we would, would you go, yeah. there's no way the Broncos are gone, you know? Uh, Kurt Capewell, I think, did a good job there. There's some really good young players coming through there. The Payne Huss thing, I like Payne. Payne's a good player, but I think Payne needs to understand it. It's not just him, it's management as well. Payne's going to be a better player with Carrigan. Him and the mm. one-two punch. I, you know, I said Flagler this as well. Yeah, yeah. and I, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Flagler's playing some great football. Um, there's, you know, um, my money's money. Look, I don't bag the players these days. If the money's there, I can understand. Do you think? Do you think Payne Haas should go to rugby union? No, I think he should stay in the league. He's a wonderful league player, but I just think. We had some of the best front rows of games seen. Lazarus, Sibna Siva, Webkey, you know, um, none of them were getting the sort of money he's getting. I know the game's changed and yeah. so it should. And mate, you know, you were a pretty you were a pretty fair front rower too, you're world class. But um, no, I, I want him to stay, but I just think it's up to the players to let their management know, you know, what they want to do. It's up to Payne yeah. what he wants to do. Yeah, like so the manager works for you. Yeah, that's right, yeah, that's yeah. right. You the know, sometimes works we forget for it because I know myself, I've been there too. The manager goes, mate, this is what you can get in rugby and this is so I go, mate, whatever you can get. So mm. you sort of go because they sell they sell to you and you go with it. Mm. Yeah. Um mate, just we, we sort of glossed over it a little bit before. Yeah, that's right. Um I I I've openly admitted about my own mental health struggles with yeah. um you know some of the on uh, the head noise podcast. Um I was so fortunate to to get on the path pretty quickly, uh, path to recovery pretty quickly. Um, do you think the game does enough for uh, its former athletes? 
I, I think they try. I think I think a lot of us struggle with that yeah. transition out of playing. And I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know how much you want to go it's into, a, it, but just mate. yeah, it's because I, I found it very difficult. But uh, I think it's I think sometimes it's a band aid solution for us. So the lucky thing for me is. When I had my two years out, I knew that I had two years to come back to put some things in place, which the media were quite good with me because I was so honest, but also I had other sponsors who stuck by me, but I knew what had to be done if I wanted to be the best that I could be. So I was getting counselling. Um, I talked about my adoption at two days old, because not many people know this, but my birth mum actually, so my mum who died was actually my adopted mum, so my birth mum was an addict. So I had to talk about some things in and around that, um, which for me, football mask all that stuff because... You yeah, know, you can train, you can wind up, you can, you know, you can use that trauma to just mm. to go out there and be a gladiator, you know. And then that's what like Gordon Tallis used to say to me. Gordon Tallis from me a couple months ago and said, he goes, mate, he goes, you know, he goes, mate, you know, I know you've been struggling a little bit lately, he goes, but you know, where's that 19 year old kid Wendell Saylor I saw? And that helped me get back on track. You know, Gordy called me, and then a few of the boys were going, mate, you know, after um, the last couple of months. And I think for for a lot of us, mate, football is our is our counselling, it yeah. is our anti-depression, yeah. it, it is our anti-anxiety medication. Yes. Well, mate, you're in that dressing room, you're yeah. having those conversations, yeah. that's like seeing a counsellor. Yes. And then you actually get on the field and it's like, well, this is what I, I feel alive all of a sudden, yeah. and you know you're going to have it next week. And that's, you, for, for me, it was the, yeah. it, it was it, it was a drug in many ways, but it, it, it stopped my, or it justified the depression, it justified the anxiety. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing, I didn't want to let my teammates down. And when you don't have that, you've got to find something outside that. So if you don't find something outside that, you're, you're drinking, you're, you're doing this, there's you're gambling. There's lots of self-medicating yeah, going right. on. I think that, especially yeah. those players that leave the game, there's a lot of self-medication yeah. going on. But, but also, I think also, I, I watch a lot of um, uh, you know uh, podcasts now, which I, I like to walk a lot. Because, mate, I used to train, I used to box, I used to, I used to lift heavy. Like I, I mightn't lift for like six or eight months and I'll, I'll deadlift 200 kilos or I'll squat 180 kilos because that's, I mean, I know, I know, but even, even Lottie goes, Lottie goes, mate, you know the Flintstones? He calls me Bam Bam, no technique and that. But for me, that's not what I want to be because if you, if you lift angry and if you, if you train, it's, that's another layer of that. You're covering up another layer. So now I try to walk. Um, I try to, I haven't got to, um, uh, meditation yet I don't know if I could sit still enough for that um, people said have you ever tried Zen stuff Zen classes I, I need to get there but for me the best medication I've got now good people around me mm. walking and, and making sure that um, that I'm honest with my friends and people I've had a lot of good people around me um, the last couple of years but especially the last couple of months who who understand that my last two years have been it's been tough you know um, mum passing away my young bloke went through some stuff um, Obviously, Paul Green's, um, you know, um, suicide battle. Um, Shane Warne, Andrew Simons. And then we get to work in a game like we do. And, and I love it because at Triple M and the sponsors that I have, you've got people who care about you. You go, mate, how you feeling, you know? And it's actually good that you've got to be honest. If you're not feeling great, you've got to be honest. Sometimes yeah. I used to mask that. I used to go, yeah, mate, I'm feeling good and pretend. And then, and then I used to walk out. I used to walk out. I'd be upset. I'd be in the car crying because things weren't going the way that I wanted it to with my life. And then even with people around me. So someone would me go, oh, mate, I just, I need a hand with this, man. I'm not doing great. And then I'd pretend that I'm doing okay. So then they didn't feel bad, mm. like they were ringing me, and then I got off the phone going, oh, that's the last thing I need. Mm. Well, but, yeah. we, we do default to, I'm all right, I'm good. Yeah. But like we default yeah. to that position. Yeah. And I think it's, so, it, it's important to recognise yeah. that you're not going to feel great all the time, but the key to it is, is knowing that you can get better. Yeah. Mate, you you can yeah. get through it, like, but reckon, not just default into like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm but it's, it's a balance. Look, clubs clubs can only do so much, but I think it's up to you and your friends to just to be honest. And it's up to you to be honest. If you're struggling, just go, mate, I'm, I'm not feeling great at the moment. Um, you know, what I've noticed the last sort of four to six weeks now, after Granny's passing and obviously, uh, you know, with Andrew Simons, I have a lot of mates who read me or we, we catch up and we have honest chats going, mate, mm. to be honest, I've had a shit 18 months, uh, mate, blah, 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 my relationship's not going well. Uh, mate, at work, I'm not enjoying my job. But even I've had a lot of uh, female friends who said, mate, great to see you training again. And, that. and you know what? Tyson Fury, I watched his, um, I don't know if you've watched it, mate, he's one of my heroes. I watched his documentaries on depression mm. and he said that he's got an addictive personality, so much like me, you know, I do everything 100 miles an hour. But the best thing that he does for himself wherever he goes around the world, he says he puts on weight and he does this and does that. And he, but he says he has his training bag because... You know, training is the best medicine. And I know myself, since I got back back on track the last sort of five to six weeks, 
Training's my best, med- yeah. best medicine. And even in a group session, so I start training by myself sometimes, but now I understand whether it's a spin class, whether it's um, a group session. And you don't have to be a hero. You have to go there. Yeah. Mate, you're doing boxing class. You don't have to go in there and act like you're Mike Tyson and that. Mm. But everyone's really good. And, mate, you get guys in there who are 65. You get girls in there 18 or, or boys who are 21. And But it's, it's you know, it's, mm. it's a great um, yeah. it's a great vibe. Yeah, we, we actually ran the Sydney Half Marathon with a group of That's former players. And it, the, the training for it was, yeah. like, that connection, it was, yes. it was really impactful. Yeah. And, and, I, and it was really helpful for for me with some difficult times transitioning from the game. And even like before, the thing was when you catch up with your mates, if I taught you, let's have a beer or two. Like now I'd go, mate, you want to grab some lunch? Let's have a coffee. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a beer. No, no, you're right. It's such an old school thing. And beer, beer masks a lot of things or alcohol masks a lot of things. And that's what I was doing. It makes it worse sometimes. It It, does. It makes it worse. Yeah, it like, works, yeah. You know, you think, oh, I'll just go and get trashed. Yeah. And then... Oh, trust me, it's, oh, I've done that. Like, yeah. it, doesn't, and it doesn't help you. It's and spi- then, it spirals, uh, it spirals yeah. to, to an even darker place. And the problem is still there. And so mm. that's the thing. And even in the last couple of months... It's I've an s- escape for about yeah. five hours. Yeah. And, and then, 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 and then, but then when you go to sleep too, the problem's still there. So even like the last sort of month, you know, I've seen a doctor and I've talked about, you know, not so much the depression thing, but just... The, because I'm obviously I'm bipolar, I'm up and down, and but it's about you know he explained to me. He said the last couple of years I've been on a bit of a dirt road, you know, you know, trying to get myself back on track with what I've been through. And he said now I want you to get back on the highway, mm. and I feel like I'm on the highway now. Good. But it's about staying on the highway because the dirt track it's hard, it's hard to uh, manoeuvre around. Yeah, and yeah. I, I I know what you mean, mate. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. it's um, it, you're on there, but you got to you yeah. recognise. The signs and, and even it's important that you, your loved ones recognise those signs as well. Of when you yeah and having that it was slightly going off course and having that what might be a bit of a difficult conversation saying yeah. I've noticed something here yeah Wendell that, James yeah. like you just gotta come back yeah we just need before you go off too far yeah and then the road to recovery again is that more difficult. But I think, um, yeah, I think also your workmates too, because you know sometimes you don't see your family that much because your family's, you know, you're busy. It's like, like we, even when we work like Triple M and stuff, and we got sponsors outside that. Like even your work colleagues, like I got work colleagues who check on me and go, like, you know, I work with a couple of guys, Gus Wall and Drew Bolton, who have been really good for me. They know I've had a bit of a tough time, and Drew goes, "Hey, going, brother." You know, mm. and it's, and, but he knows, and then Gus Wallen's been really good, and Gus Gus carries his own stuff. Can I tell you what Gus Wallen does? I, I couldn't do. Um, you know, and I'll be honest with you, there was, there was a couple months ago, just after my son's uh, court case and that, and, and it was just emotion, and, and he looks at me and he goes, mate, you all right? And, and I just started crying in, in the studio. Mm. No one would see that, but then what we do is we reset, and we have honest conversations, but like, I, I, I let it get, get out, and then and we reset, but then no one else sees, but then our team and our family there, it's, you know, whether it's Laura Boucher or whatever, it's great. So we're all left one another, because, mate, we're, we're all doing it a bit tough. In the yeah. last two and a half years, We've had uh, lockdowns and all this and people, we just don't know what someone's gone through. So I always try and be real positive around people. Yeah. And if I see someone sitting by themselves at a bar or a cafe, I always say hello or, mate, what's that? do you want to come and join us? You know, mm. I think it's an easy thing to do. Yeah. You're right. And, I, and I don't hang around bars too much anymore. <laughs> but when I go to a bar, I do like a bar. Yeah. Don't, don't we all? <laughs> don't we all? Um, before we get into the future yeah. and what the future may hold, one of the things you spoke about dancing with the stars. Mm. I got to witness your your dance moves in action a couple of weekends ago <laughs> with producer Charlie as well. We were Charlie wasn't so impressed. I was blown away. Yeah. Like, I, I I thought you moved yeah. were like off the cuff dancing as well. Yeah. Like this wasn't preempted. This was nah. it was very good. Well, I, look, I just okay. want to just want to say yeah. thanks. But you, but you know why I like to dance is because when I was younger and I was going through a bit of stuff, because I got bullied through school as well when I wasn't such a the best athlete. It was also the older kids that bullied me. So I went through a lot of bullying, but I knew what those were like discos and that uh, at school and that. If you could dance, everyone's going, oh, mate, he can dance. So, mate, I know Charlie, you know, he's that new cutting edge, you know. He's that cutting edge where they all think they can dance and he thinks he's a bit all right too. But I know for, for, for a kid like me, when I used to dance, then, you know, the boys would go, mate, he can dance. And the girls would go, oh, he can dance. And then that but way... This was like, this, when we were in that uh, that bar, this yeah. was proper. Yeah. I, like, this wasn't mucking around. This was proper no. formal, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but, but I do like dancing. D- dancing has always been something that I've enjoyed doing. Um, like, I did the Masked Singer. And, and I, mate, I'm not the best singer, but but you can get away with it because you're dancing. Mm. Dancing sort of carries it. And um, yeah, dancing's fun, mate, but it's like anything, you know. Um, if you can have fun and do things that you like, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, good on you. Um, 
So, yep, now you're, you've you got these sponsorships, your yeah. massive role in um, a, a, a Triple M, part yeah. of the family there. What does the future hold? Because you you're not even, what are you now, mid? Oh, no, I'm 48, I'm 48. 48. Um, look, I think for me, the most important thing for me too now, I've got obviously got three kids now, I've got a granddaughter, um, and I just think for me, to be the best version of myself now, and, and, and just for the first time, just to be me, and I, and I just understand, to be me, I've got to be consistent. Um, I can't be up and down. I, I love my job. But, you know? well, I th- sorry, mate. I, I think you can be up and down. Like, and it's yeah. okay to be. But I think for do you me... Know, do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. I, I know I'm going to be up and down, got yeah. good days and bad days. Yeah, I know but, that. But I mean, for me, consistent. My good days and bad days are a, a long way apart. And I think people uh, who know me, so just closing the gap on yeah. both and just doing things that I know are going to work for me. So I know, like... I catch up with mates now during the week, and if they're having lunch and they're having a couple of beers and wine, mate, it's all right for them, but it's not all right for me because I've got to work in the afternoon, 2.30, you know? Um, uh, and and I, I get chances to reward myself with sponsors and whatever. Like this weekend, you know, or the, the, the weekend, you know, I'll call the footy and then I'll go to the Swans um, Collingwood game in a corporate box. I'll have a good time there, but not too good of a time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Who's hooked you up with that? Oh, one of the sponsors from Triple M, you know, because <laughs> I'm doing good things there. I think Makita's oh, good. thanks, yeah. Yeah. Good on you. Good know, on you. But you, well, know, you get it, it. Is there, is you know, is the, is the role within the media what you want to continue Mate, I, to do, so, or, or, or or what sort of like profession? So I'll, like I'll, where, I'll, do you, where do you see yourself going? I'll do a lot of stuff back in grassroots as well now. Now that the COVID, so I'll go to Fiji, uh, do a bit of stuff in the Fiji with coaching, uh, whether it's the league or the rugby programs over there. Um, I've got some sponsors outside that, uh, Good Bloke Society, about men having honest chats and stuff. Um, and just sort of the bigger things, because sometimes I get time poor, but I know that rush here at Triple M, that's my priority, and the football calls. So Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, one last question, yeah. mate. Do you miss playing? No, I don't. I don't. I don't because I understand I've had my time in it, but I want the next generation to understand when you get there, enjoy it, because it goes so quickly and it's so rewarding. The best thing I got from football is camaraderie and mateship. And I learned that in the last couple of months when, when I had two weeks off work, I had so many phone calls. Laurie Daly, Andrew Johns, my best mates from back home, um, you know, friends who love me, friends who care about me. And I understand you know, football has been a wonderful vehicle to where I'm going and I've got a lot more to offer. Yeah, most definitely. Well, actually, sorry, Dale, I did yeah. say last question, oh, but sorry. one more. We, we spoke before we, um, before we started recording about yeah. just any, any good party stories. Oh. Um, oh, you, you, you told us one about the after the World Cup in 2000. Yeah, yeah, look, actually, I'll tell you the story. It's a good story, too, because everyone knew that 2000 World Cup side was a pretty fun side. Um, so in Leeds, as you know, Leeds, we were on the corner of the hotel on the corner there. I don't know if it was the Marriott or one of the hotels in the corner. I forget what it was. And then there was a place called the Majestic. <laughs> so can you imagine, like, this, is, this was our team. Craig Gower, Brian Fletcher, Gordon Tallis, Darren Lockyer, Andrew Johns, Ben Kennedy, uh, you know, Brad Fittler. Anyway, so Ryan Girdler. Anyway, so there's Nathan Hindmarsh, Brian Fletcher. Mate, what a, what a 2000 Cup team. Um, anyway, so Matty Rogers. So, you know, we finished, we beat New Zealand at Old Trafford. Um, I don't know, the winger Wendell Saylor got man in the match or something. <laughs> so, no, no. Uh, anyway, so then we were obviously having a good night and that all of a sudden, Fat Boys, they said, oh, mate, Fat Boys Slim's playing. And the boys go, what? So, you know, someone set our suits back on. Next minute, we see Darren Lockyer walk with his suit, with his sleeves ripped off and his footy boots walking into the nightclub and they let him in. Like, obviously, World Cup winning fullback Darren Lockyer. Mm. And it's funny to see, you know, I look at Thurston and I look at all these guys now and it's funny, like, Lockie, like, Lockie was life of the party. So he was like the younger, you know, we'd all come through. It was like me, Freddie and all those guys and Joey. But Lockie was on fire that trip. So that was, uh, that was Darren Lockyer. And then I think he ended up captain Australia not long after that. So um, it was on fire and it was a good couple of days because Chris Anderson, he was our... Um, he was our coach, and he let us have fun when it was time to have fun. Nice. It's, <clears throat> it's, I always think it's important. Never take yourself too seriously. Yeah. And know and tip the scales. It's Life's about balance. As, well, that's as what Darren Lockyer said. Can I say this? That's why, when you talk about the best players of the game, I think that, you know, there's obviously Cam Smith there, Billy Slater on that. But I think for me, Andrew Johns was the best that I played with, with and against. And a lot of the boys say they think Darren Lockyer is because not just what he did on the field, we know what he did on the field too, but his leadership off the field as well. I mean, that's obviously, he was a young Darren Lockyer then. He, he got into a mature Darren Lockyer, but let me tell you, Darren Lockyer's got two personalities. There's Darren and there's Daryl. 
<laughs> we'll leave it at that. Del, thanks, thanks so much for joining thanks, us Jimmy. here on the buy round, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really enjoy sitting down, having yeah. honest conversations with you. I enjoy working with you yeah. and our time together in Triple N. So the first of many, thank you so much, everybody, for... Well, thank you so much for, for no. joining us here. I'm sure the, the listeners and the viewers will love hearing your stories, mate. You've been an absolute pleasure. Um, one of the, a living legend, larger than life character. Um, I wish you all the very best for the future. And um, mate, just remember it's it's okay to, yeah, to not be I'll okay, be, mate. We're all yeah. we're all in that boat and we've all got to have each other's back. Thanks, mate. I really appreciate it. Always enjoyed watching you play, mate. I love your blubs. One thing I'll always say, when we were having a few drinks the other night, I just said, Jimmy, honestly, how, how would you stop me? You know, because I used to love coming in, <laughs> taking those hit ups, and you explained to me how you chopped me down. So that's what I, I love about you. I love watching you play, love your passion, and uh, you bring it to Triple M uh, when I'm working with you, and that's what people like you too, mate. So well done, big man. Thanks, mate. I appreciate it. Just to just to clarify, I think I think what I said to you is I'd pretend to be fatigued. So you'd think, I, I reckon I'd play with you. Uh, you you'd be going, oh, look, there's Graham. He, he, he's on his arse here. He's yeah. looking, so I'd pretend like hands on the hips, and then boom. Oh, just yeah. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd, I don't know if it'd work. It'd still be good. It'd yeah. be good class because I love yeah. your passion, mate. Don't worry, I used to love. Uh, it'd be good, mate. Either way, because I know you played that aqua rugby, so I'm a chance of playing this year. Yeah, don't be coming through the middle with you, mate. If I come through the mate. middle, you're gonna be in trouble. I'm not trained for that. You're gonna try. You're gonna yeah, because I think you and Gazney played last year. Last yeah, year. yeah, we, I couldn't we did. play. Yeah, I couldn't play. I had yeah. some other things on, but um, yeah. I think it's on again. I think it's, it's on, on again in yeah. November. Maybe we can get on the same team. Maybe Del. we could. Maybe tri that. Triple M can get a team in there somehow. How good would it be? Yeah, yeah. Let's we get do producer it. Charlie White in there. He told me he used to play half back <laughs> in the day. He told me he'd be all right. That could be exposed. Producer Charlie White, Aqua yeah. Rugby Tournament. Yeah, we can maybe we'll speak to Jimmy Galvin and yeah, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, I was with you the other day, mate. So it was good. Yeah, yeah. Magic again. All right. Thanks, Del. Thanks, mate.